<laughs> well, when you're young, you're so excited that somebody else yes. has to invest in you. And, you know, they get caught up in it and they don't do their due diligence. So my advice to you, anybody watching, yeah, do your due diligence. Hire a lawyer, an entertainment yeah. lawyer. Yes. You know exactly yeah, a specific entertainment lawyer. Not the guy who sold yeah. your house, you know, your mom's house. Right. You know, you, you have to know what you're doing. You have to know what you're doing. Yeah. And if you're offered a contract, uh, it doesn't matter if you feel like you can't <laughs> afford the lawyer. You can afford the lawyer better than you can afford to sign a bad contract. Exactly. Yeah. So it is it's pennies, always going to be worth the money. in comparison. Welcome to the Vocal Lab. I'm Sarah Ramsey, and this show aims to pull back the curtain on the entertainment industry, where veterans give up-and-coming artists some of the information they wish they'd had when they were just starting out. Sort of a music industry primer, if you will. Welcome to the Vocal Lab. Today, my guest is Catherine St. Germain, who is an accomplished vocalist who has shared the stage and toured the world with some of music's biggest names, including... David Foster, Natalie Cole, Ray Charles, Paul Rogers, Loverboy, and her late great uncle, Lenny Bro. She grew up singing on the hit Canadian television show, Big Sky Country, and the Rocky Roulette Show. Her voice can also be heard on many TV and radio ads and at Legoland theme parks in the US and the UK. Thanks for joining me today, Kat. How, how are you, sir? I'm good, and I'm so happy to have you here with me. Happy to be here. (laughs) Thank you. So do you want to tell us your story briefly for those who might be meeting you for the first time today, uh, a little bit about who you are and your journey in the biz and how you got where you are today? Yeah. um, Well, I come from a showbiz family. My mom and her sister uh, were... uh, singing sisters the neville sisters in the early or early the late 50s and then the early 60s and then my aunt went on to have her own television show on cbc up in canada mm-hmm. called the peggy neville show mm-hmm. and what her one of her shows was one of the first uh first ones aired in color really? yeah and i remember i remember watching and she uh she basically, I think she was wearing a red dress and she like mentioned, you can see my dress is red. And, you know, if you're watching, cause they, oh, yeah, cool. they, they did it in color. <laughs> yeah. It was very cool. Yeah. Um, anyway, my mom, uh, she met my dad doing a TV show in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where I grew up and, mm-hmm. you know, they fell in love right away and <laughs> singing together and eloped when they were 19 and, mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. And then had two little girls by the time they were 21. Ooh. Yeah. So that, that was kind of crazy. And then my mom stopped singing, but uh, my sister and I always sang and my mom always sang around mm-hmm. the house. And my dad was always in television and radio. He always had a TV show. It seemed like he did uh, red river uh, jamboree uh, mm-hmm. hoot nanny. Uh, (laughs) we went to Toronto when I was in grade two, I think it was. And he had a show called time for living with, and Mm -hmm. Alan Thicke was one of the writers and he actually got to be good friends with him. Uh, and then what was it? The other one he, and it was some other show and he had all kinds of crazy guests like Anne Murray. I have a video of him and Anne Murray singing a duet together and they became fast friends and, you know, they're still (laughs) friends to this day. Um, yeah. Just grew up around around music all the time and, and uh, you know, sang at the rodeos with my dad. And then when I was about 15, he uh, they asked him to write and produce a show uh, called Big Sky Country. And mm-hmm. it was, you know, a variety show. We had guests from Nashville. And it went on for 13 years, the second longest running uh, variety show in Canada next to Tommy Hunter. And wow. my sister and I starred alongside him. That was part of the yep. deal they wanted. They wanted a family thing. So, <laughs> so I kind of grew up there uh, on that show. And uh, about three years into it, I joined a band called Rocky Roulette. And we, mm-hmm. <coughs> excuse me, we toured all across Canada and some of the uh, northern states or easier mm-hmm. to get to. And we won a Trans Canada yeah. uh, rock contest. 
in the early 80s. Yeah. And we did a single with Bob Ezrin, uh, who was working with um, Alice Cooper at the time. And mm-hmm. Anyway, we, we were very successful. We had a we had a TV show on CBC for two years as well. But mm-hmm. I had a I had a name. My my stage name was Rita Rigatoni. <laughs> and, and at one point on Sunday nights in Winnipeg at ten o'clock on Global was my dad's TV show. So there uh-huh. I was, you know, singing gospel tunes and country tunes with with you know the nice dresses done up to here and long sleeves and you know the wholesome. Yeah wholesome young gal. And then at 10 30, he switched to CBC and it was the Rocky Valetti show. And there I am as Rita Rigatoni in my spandex pants and my pumps, my little <laughs> tight shirt singing respect. And because we did all like old Motown and, you know, 60s, 70s music. It, it was a blast. And nobody believed I was the same person. That's so yeah. funny. I did not know that really? about your history. Oh. I've known you for a long time. I did not know. Well, I mean, as I was researching our interview yeah. today, I knew the, like, I learned the Rita Rigatoni piece of it, but I didn't know that it had been like back to back and such yeah. opposite ends of the spectrum oh, like completely that. Completely opposite. That's really funny. And, and actually on YouTube, I think there's one Rocky Rilletti show. I think we did like 14 shows. And mm-hmm. there's only one on YouTube. I don't know why there's only one, but if anybody's interested, R O C K I <laughs> R O L L E T T I, the Rocky Relay yeah. Show. It's hilarious. It's so funny. Like we had little skits and stuff, <laughs> and we had an actor from CBC who played our manager, and he's always drunk, of course. And <laughs> it's just yeah. like, anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was a way to grow up. Yeah, let me tell you. Yeah. yeah. No kidding. And everybody was like 10 years older than me in the band. It was a 10 piece band yeah. at times. So I was just like, wow, this is so much fun. <laughs> yeah. Is it really like learning trial by yeah. fire, right? Yeah. 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 So, anyway. Well, here on the Vocal Lab, we aim to shine a light into the industry through the lens of what I know now that I wish I'd known then. <laughs> So with that in mind, if you were starting your career all over again, is there anything that you would do differently? You know, I don't think so. Um, yeah. No, I mean, you know, it would have been nice to have a recording career and, you know, be, you know, like some people we know. But, yeah. you know, I was offered a couple of record contracts back in the day. And mm-hmm. the very first one actually was with Rocky Rilletti. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. And they just wanted um, Peter Jordan, who played Rocky Rilletti, myself, and the other girl in the band, my good good friend, Susan Lethbridge, and her name was Frida People. <laughs> <laughs> but they just wanted the three of us. They didn't want the rest of the band, which, you know, yeah. back then, I guess, is was common. And we had original songs. We were kind of like talking heads, almost like it was just kind of wacky songs. Uh-huh. And anyway... Um, it was from A&M Records, and I still have it. I still have that contract. It was about yeah. 40 pages, like double-sided. And my dad actually uh, called Anne Marie's, I can't remember if it was his or her, her manager or her lawyer, who was a friend of yeah. my dad's. And he came over to my dad's house, and I went over, and we went through it. And he, you know, I, he said, just stop me if I'm reading something you don't understand. So I'd stop him, and... He, you know, explained to me, blah, blah, blah. Basically, mm-hmm. he was signing away your entire life <laughs> mm-hmm. forever, even beyond. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. anyways, when, when he was finished, he looked at me and he said, so are you going to sign? And I said, hell no. He said, good for you. <laughs> and, and then I shared the information with Susan and Pete and they agreed that, you know, it was yeah. not going to be good for us. Yeah. yeah. And then the second, uh, the second time it was just for a, like, a uh, Oh, why can't I think of the word, uh, when you're developing an artist Yeah, and one of the songs that they wanted to really push, um, uh, apparently according to my boyfriend at the time was very sexually explicit. And I was like, huh? Uh-huh. I thought it was about fruit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> so, you know, I'm like, hmm. I wasn't crazy about the song anyways. It was really poppy and I really didn't want to be a pop artist. I didn't want to be known as that. Mm-hmm. I was more, I, you know, personally, I was more into like bluesy, just, you know, I, I, I didn't want to be the pop tart, so to speak. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so, yeah. So I tried to get a different song, but they were set on that one. And so I said, no. Yeah. But like I said, I would not, I, I wouldn't change those things. Um, I don't owe anyone anything. I've never owed anyone anything. You know what I mean? And it, yeah. and it was a good feeling because yeah, yeah. I knew people who did and it was hell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There, a lot of bad can oh, come yeah. from signing bad contracts. Exactly. And there are so many bad contracts out there to be signed. <laughs> well, when you're young, you're so excited that somebody has yes. to invest in you and you know, they get caught up in it and they don't do their due diligence. So my advice to you, anybody watching, yeah, do your due diligence, hire a lawyer, an entertainment yeah. lawyer. And yes. Know exactly. Specifically. Yeah. A specific entertainment lawyer, not the guy who sold yeah. your house, you know, your mom's house, right. you know, you, you have to know what you're doing. You have to know what you're doing. Yeah. And if you're offered a contract, uh, it doesn't matter if you feel like you can't <laughs> afford the lawyer. You can afford the lawyer better than you can afford to sign a bad contract. Exactly. Yeah. So it is it's always in going com- to be worth the money. in comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So through that same lens, if you were going back to start your career all over again, are there any things that you would very specifically do the same way again? Um, yeah, I would just be, I would question anything that didn't feel right. Mm-hmm. Um, I always did. And, you know, it got me called names a lot of times, but I always just chalked it up to if I was a guy, they'd just call me a, a hard ass or smart business person. You know, right. as a woman, you get called mm-hmm. the B, the B word all yeah. the time. Oh, you, you can say all the words ah, you want okay. on here, by the way. Go She's for it. She's such a bitch, you know? Yeah. I like, no, yeah, I'm yeah. not. I'm just, you know, looking out for for not only me, but the people around me. And, you know, I've yeah. always been, you know, always been uh, a champion for the musician. And I, I, I am here to testify to that because I have... I have been the recipient of it and I have watched you do it for so many people in our community. You absolutely have been that for so many people championing people and making sure that they are um, taken care of like that, that they're not getting screwed, that they are appreciate that they are doing what is expected of them, that they are yeah. doing their best job and that they are being appropriately rewarded for it, you know, whatever <laughs> rewarded yeah. for it. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you for yeah. saying that, but that means a lot. Yeah. It's, um, it's one of the things that I think of most when I think of you actually yeah. is, is how you show up in that role. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. 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 So we are in an industry that sees wildly varying uh, levels of education around music uh, and theory and which supplements talent. What has your experience been in terms of musical education and how did it impact your work? Well, I don't have any formal training. I've never taken yeah. any vocal lessons. I took piano when I was a kid. I actually took accordion. <laughs> Love that. If, if you I, get, I really if hope just that like, rig a read a- me and my little red accordion. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to remember the guy's name. He, he was a music teacher and he had a music shop in Winnipeg. Said Ted yeah. Omar or something, but he taught everything. He taught drums and bass and guitar and, and piano. And I chose accordion. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and you know, and I can still pick it up and find that I think it's C sharp, the one with the indent on the left, uh-huh. the side without the keys. 
or maybe it's just plain C. Maybe it's not a C sharp. I don't know. Too many. Too I many can honestly things. say no. I, <laughs> I have never held an accordion. I, I have held lots of instruments oh, and accordion is not to. one of them. So I have no idea. You have to. <laughs> I know what my next gift to you is going to be. <laughs> I think, I think you have a big one coming up and uh, we might have to do a little here in Palm Springs. <laughs> anyway, so back to that. So I, um, it, it was funny because in school, I went to eight different schools and I was, oh my always, gosh. I was in choir. And in Winnipeg at the yeah. time when I was going to school, basically the two uh, electives were choir or art. And for choir, mm-hmm. of course, you had to audition. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I would purposely mm-hmm. sing flat, just like, just be all over the place because I wanted to be an art class. I didn't want to be a singer. Um, and, and then, you know, the thing would come up on the board, everybody would be in the hallway who made choir. And there's so many people who just desperately wanted to be in choir, <laughs> but they couldn't sing. And there's my name. <laughs> And if they'd heard me in the audition, they'd be going, what in the world is going on? How did she get in and not me? Anyway, so I was always in choir. And then I remember in grade eight, so I was 13, 12 or 13. Yeah. The choir teacher, her name was oh, Miss Mel, Mel, uh, Melnick or Malcolm. I can't remember. Anyhow, she chose five. There was five or six of us in the choir to form a small choir. And we mm-hmm. did the coolest songs, all like like four part harmonies, um, mm-hmm. but it was all by ear. It wasn't theory at all. Oh, she would yeah, teach yeah. us the part on the piano. We'd learn it. Um, we all had really good ears, and you know could learn the stuff really fast. We did all kinds of little concerts and stuff at the mall, and you know Christmas at the school. It was the small choir, yeah. just us. Um, and that yeah. really turned turned my my uh, my feeling for singing around. Yeah, it was at that point I thought, "This is cool. I love singing harmony." And I was singing yeah. harmony anyway with my sister. She was the one who wanted to be mm-hmm. up front, so I would always, you know, at the rodeo, yeah. I'd just sing background vocals because I could. Yeah. And then a couple of years later, fast forward to my dad getting the Big Sky Country Show. One of the things was Crystal and I, my sister, we had to sing a solo on every show, mm. but it paid money. So I said, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. What kind of incentive and then that the was it, you paycheck know? is. I quickly did the math and, you know, with the, the uh, pilot was four, only four episodes. So it's hmm, four yeah. times. Oh, okay. Hmm. You know, you're 15. You're like, okay. Plus my mom yeah. and dad were divorced at the time and we were living with my grandparents and I needed money. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 You know? Yeah. So anyway, so yeah, with yeah. Theory, I mean, I can, if I have a starting note on a vocal chart, I mean, I made it through years and years and years of session work by just yeah. having at least the part played one time and it, it, you know, I could do it and I could yeah. follow if I had my first note, I could follow the chart. Yeah. But I know people well, I think- who can actually look at it and start singing and they know it. It's yes. I'm like, what? How do you do that? <laughs> yeah. Practice. Yeah, and, I don't and know. You, got, you know, you got it. If, if sight reading is a skill unto itself, and like I can sight read, but it's a muscle. And if I'm out of the habit, I go back to it, and it isn't very. It isn't very no. good to start with. Like I have to work back up to it. But it's. I know a lot of singers who don't actually read. However, like you're talking about. If they have a chart in front of them and a starting note, uh, and hopefully they've heard it once, mm-hmm. but the shape of it on the exactly. on the chart, that is enough. Even if they can't tell you exactly what the notes are and, and exactly what the rhythms are, it's still a pretty good visual guide to go along with their yeah. ears and the combo works well. Yeah. And so it still has a, a use. Yeah. I mean, my, I do my yeah. own little vocal charts and they are exactly that shapes. Yeah. They're just a shape and, you know, I can't go up here. I go down here. The trills here, yeah. you know? Yeah. I do the same thing on lyrics. I mean, when I'm like writing 
notes for myself to work with a like a pop yeah. band, I almost never will write a proper chart for myself. Yeah. I'll write a chart for the band, yeah, yeah. but I won't write a chart for myself. I'll have a lyric sheet and I will do the same yeah. thing. I will write a series yeah. of dots <laughs> for a line or what it, this, the shape of what yeah, I need, yeah. because that's all I need for that. Part. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So in terms of growing up working in a showbiz family, um, you worked with your dad, like you said, uh, Ray St. Germain on Big Sky Country, Mm -hmm. and you worked with your uncle, Lenny Bro. Actually, didn't really work with Lenny. Um, My dad and Lenny worked together a lot. Okay. Um, I did, you know, I'd be singing with my dad and Lenny would come in and play. Um, He'd come over and, you know, I, I can remember specifically one time him coming over and picking up the guitar and, and playing Mr. Sandman and me singing it with him. Like it was yeah. such a special moment, you know? No kidding. Um, he was such a great player. Oh my God. Like just a, just a freak. <laughs> yeah. And, and for those who don't know, because we have an audience who uh, is probably more rooted in like pop and rock music, but <clears throat> did, do you want to just sort of tell them who, who yeah, your uncle Lenny, is? Well, Lenny Bro, he was a master on the on the guitar. He um, basically any guitar player knows who Lenny Bro was. Unfortunately, he passed in the eighties. Um, he, he just he he could make uh, he could play the guitar, and it sounded like four different guitar players. He'd have the bass going mm-hmm. with his with his pinky. Or um, it, I don't even know how to explain it, but he'd do rhythms. Uh, the bass would be happening, um, and and also a a melody line on top. Like who yeah. does that? And and it, he really lived in the jazz world, right? Um, yeah, in, jazz in the picking world. Like um, Chet, your style, one of his best friends, and you know he. Uh, I think they learned a lot from each other. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but like jazz, because the chords he came up with were so insane. Mm-hmm. He had, I think, I know he had a seven string guitar. I think he may have had an eight string guitar as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, add the string, a lot of you're going to get a lot of notes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you know, jazz is, yeah. Jazz would probably yeah. be the best yeah. way to describe what, what he yeah. did, but he, yeah. he was, he was genius. Yeah. Literally. So be- between your dad and your uncle and your husband, Mike Reno of Loverboy, who you work with regularly as well. Do you want to talk about um, <laughs> the ups and downs of working with family? Oh, <laughs> oh, I mean, <laughs> like, I get it. I've worked with family no, yeah. in lots of different contexts, too. Yeah, and we have a very similar. Uh, sometimes it's great. And sometimes it's harder because they are family. Yeah, I think um, the best part about it is you just can't get that blend that you can get with yeah. family. It's just, uh, yep. I mean, it's just magic. You just don't even have to work. No, it just It just happens. happens. Yeah. So I have two brothers and two sisters. um, And Mm -hmm. we used to do uh, every few years, we'd get together and do a family show with my dad. And as, Mm -hmm. as we all got a little bit older, suddenly there was like the grandkids were joining in. And the last one we did was with um, three grandchildren and the five kids and my dad. Wow. Yeah. It was pretty special. It was a 2019 yeah. And my one of my nieces, uh, Gemma, my brother Raymond's daughter, she sang Sweet Child of Mine. She was Oh eight. my gosh. She was eight and she <laughs> killed it. Like I love it. She she's incredible. I mean, she's 13 now and she's into dance and volleyball. She doesn't even want to mm-hmm. sing, but man, can that girl sing? She doesn't have to even try. Yeah. It drives me crazy. <laughs> like, <laughs> what? Anyway, and then my little brother and sister, <laughs> Sherry St. Germain and, and David St. Germain, they're from my dad's second marriage. They are uber mm-hmm. talented, like just uh, insane. But anyway, 
uh, whenever we would do the family shows, I was the one in charge. My dad would say, mm-hmm. you take care of everything. So I, I'd be in charge. So that was a little challenging because when you're family, you mm-hmm. think you can say no. And, you know, if I wasn't their family, they'd be, <laughs> yes, sir. You know, of course, you know, yeah. instead, no, I'm tired. Yeah. I don't want to rehearse. It's like, <laughs> anyway. And then, you know, back, back in the television show days with my sister and I, um, <laughs> there was a lot of drinking going on back then. Not my sister and I, cause we were yeah. young, but my dad, my dad drank a lot. So a lot of times and yeah. we were always, re- um, uh, recording the shows on location. So we would uh, mm-hmm. record, we would record all the music in the springtime in the studio. Mm-hmm. We'd spend like weeks in the studio doing, we did 13 shows a year, except for that first year. We only did four. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. <coughs> Excuse me, in the summer, our summer would be full because we'd do 13 shows all on location somewhere in Manitoba, you know, and Global had this big <laughs> mobile truck that would come and then there'd be, mm-hmm. you know, you'd be singing a song in the grass, there'd be a monitor somewhere hidden in the grass so you could hear, hear yourself <laughs> and you'd be lip syncing away and you'd make mistakes sometimes, you know, but yeah, you know, it was a tight budget. It wasn't a huge budget show. So we rarely got to do things over. So I have some pretty funny bloopers. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I can remember several times my dad, you know, he'd be like hung over and he'd be not being very nice. And I'd always be the one to challenge yeah. him. And, yeah. And I remember one time he, he, uh, Oh, what happened now? I, Oh, I just refused to put up with it. So my sister and I both walked off the stage. Uh, We were doing, I don't know, some song, uh, like a barn thing. So we were like a barn dance type type thing. And and my dad said, oh, they yelled at me, how unprofessional, you know. It wasn't, it was like we were on a, a, like we'd done a take and then we were getting ready to set up to another take. And and I I just said, "I, I need a break, you know. And he goes, oh, yeah. professional. Oh. So I went in the mobile and the guitar player's wife, Edie, she kind of calmed me down because I was so mad at him. He was so, he was so hung over. <laughs> he, he could literally smell yeah. it on him. Sorry, dad. I don't mean to be yeah. airing your dirty laundry, but honestly. <laughs> um, anyways, and then I, so I came back out quickly because I know time is money and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Then we go back out and we're just about to do the take. My dad puts his guitar down and he leaves the stage. I go, how unprofessional. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Back at you, big guy. (laughs) Or another time in the studio when we were recording the shows, my sister and I, I don't know what got into us. Something was funny. And we, we were trying to sing the song and, you know, it's like, okay, you're recording three, two, one, hear the music. And we start singing and, and then we start laughing. And so we'd have to stop and start again. Right. Well, after about four or five uh-huh. times, and my dad is getting madder and madder and madder. And we just thought it was funny. <laughs> it was funnier and more funny every time. And he was just mad, more mad. And, and every time the take was shorter and shorter and shorter until finally we said, that's it. We're done for the day. <laughs> it anyway, is the so, worst when you get the giggles. Oh my gosh. Oh. Yeah. But you know, when you're not with your family, you like, at least like I've had the giggles in the studio many times, but you know, with a producer or, you know, some client you just met, especially the, I used to sing a lot of Mattel commercials. Oh boy. Yeah. There was some, there was some funny moments, but you know, you could compose yourself a lot quicker. quicker you get your shit together a lot, a lot faster a lot when it's and, strangers. Yeah. And, and, you know, you get it done, but men, it's your family. It's like, yeah, I just remember him getting yeah. so mad, like matter and matter and matter. And it was just funnier and funnier for us every time. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, it. working with family is definitely a different dynamic. I get it. We, I mean, our, our family did for years, I don't know, 20 years, something like that. Every year, my dad would write an arrangement of a Christmas song. Yes. And we would go into the studio and record it in four part, six part, eight part, whatever harmony. And we would send it out. And that was our 
family Christmas cards. I know I received many. You've been the recipient. Yes. Yes. I have them all. <laughs> and they are they are so incredible. And, oh, well, thank you. And and you know what? I I love having those and I love having that piece of family history, but First of all, everybody used to say, oh, you guys must just cherish that time at Christmas. You go into the family, all as a studio, uh, into the studio, all as a family. And I thought, we are never in there all as a family. We are in there one at a time tracking yeah. one by one. Never, ever is it all as a family. But also, my dad used to produce. Now, my dad was a producer. That was what he did for a living. But my dad had a very specific personality. He had a pretty intense, commanding, yeah. boss in charge, if we're being honest, intimidating. Yeah, my dad. Kind of personality. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think I ever left a session of doing our family Christmas cards not crying. I know. Because <laughs> I was also convinced at the every at the end of every single one of those sessions that my dad thought I was a terrible singer. <laughs> Which wasn't true, but no. it was just like the process of working with family is hard. Yeah. And it stirs up all sorts of weird shit. <laughs> Especially at Christmas time. Yeah. 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 And of course, we were always doing them on like December 23rd. Yeah, of course. In order Last to minute. send out by Christmas, right? Yeah. Yeah. Whether you have yeah. time or not, get in here and do it. It's like, hooray. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. Um. Yeah. So you have Métis heritage, yes. correct? Yeah. Yes. How has that woven into your career? Um, I got to do a lot of really interesting um, stuff with the Assembly First Nations. Um, yeah. I hosted the first um, Aboriginal People's uh, Choice Awards. Uh, the very yeah. first one with Lauren Cardinal from Corner Gas. And yeah. Um, so we, we, you know, flagshipped it and it was so successful. It, it just was incredible. I remember the very opening scene, it was at the Winnipeg Convention Center. It was televised and mm -hmm. there must have been 500 uh, dancers, Aboriginal dancers, like hoop oh, dancers wow. and drummers. And, and just, it was so incredible. And they all entered from the back of the arena yeah, yeah, it was yeah. at the arena, and they they went through like the people on the floor, like through the uh, the rows. Yeah, and it was so powerful. I I, I was so unprepared yeah. for it. I was almost in tears. I was. It just was like so. It was such a beautiful display of of pride. You know what I mean? And just yeah, so powerful. Anyway, um, so I got to do that. That was super fun. And I also got to host a lot of um, award shows and um, in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. Funny story, Mike came with me one time to Ottawa. I can't remember what I was hosting. Um, but in the morning, uh, we ordered room service for breakfast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, knock, knock, knock. Mike goes to the door. And the guy goes, good morning, Mr. St. Germain. <laughs> 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 he goes, I think I might change my name. I kind of like it. <laughs> I thought Reno is so much easier to spell, honey. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, I, I've I've had a lot of amazing opportunities because of because of my um, Cree heritage, and I yeah. just have a lot of respect for it, and um, I'm proud of it, and. It's not a secret, mm -hmm. you know, my dad, mm -hmm. he kind of kept it a secret for a long time. Well, he was unaware actually. Mm -hmm. And when he did find yeah. out, um, cause my grandfather held, uh, I hit it, his dad. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cause it was a lot easier to be a white man than it was to yep. be an Indian. And Unfortunately in that yeah. period of time, yeah, it, it was uh, a, a stark contract i mean yeah it's we are still not where it should be in this country or many others uh in terms of 
Oh, I know. It's, it's just and, insane. You think after all these, all that. after all these years, like there's a, <clears throat> a whole section of Winnipeg um, called St. Germain. Um, really? Yeah. My great or my grandfather, he was, um, uh, was it after him? I'm going to get it all wrong. But anyways, it's after, it's named after our family. And it probably yeah. never would have been had they known that they were native. Do you know what I mean? Inter yeah. 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 I mean, they all know now because <laughs> my dad yeah. brought it forefront and yeah. Well, good for him for, for doing that. Yeah. When, when he was able to. Yeah. And he did because he got yeah. into photography at one point and um, mm -hmm. he would, he would take pictures of my, my great grandparents, his grandparents, um, like close ups. And I remember yeah. him, my great grand, I still have <clears throat> the picture. It's an eight by 10. My dad actually developed it himself. Like he had his little, his little uh, dark room and all that kind of stuff. And he's, he's definitely an Indian. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. wow, you know, like mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. And then my grandfather, yeah, <clears throat> he, he was Indian as well, but he could pass off not being, but then one summer yeah. my dad asked him, he just said, you know, you look Indian and grandpa is definitely like, are we? And he said, yeah, we are. We're Cree. Yeah. 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 It's a, uh, it's a such an important hmm, part of the heritage. I mean, obviously within your family, but as a country, and uh, I think it's really important that those pieces are brought forth and and into the the landscape and loved and accepted. Yeah, you know, and, you know, and they're, honored. They're as, like, <laughs> excuse me a lot of successful native people in the world and in Canada yeah. and, you know, let's celebrate that, you know, we still have yeah. to remember what happened, yeah. but let's celebrate the good, like more, <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in the course of your career, you have worked with some really big names, people like David Foster, Natalie Cole, Ray Charles, Paul Rogers. Um, do you want to talk a, a little bit about how uh, those kinds of opportunities unfolded? How how you got to those sort of opportunities in your career? Um, sure. Um, <clears throat> well, in Winnipeg, we had a lot of um, uh, guests from Nashville, so mm -hmm. I actually I got to work with like Bobby Bear and. Um, Oh gosh, I'm having a brain fart again. Here's a guy who did six days <laughs> on the road, and I'm going to make it home tonight. Uh, Dave Dudley, yeah. Dave Dudley. Yeah. Um, we had Loretta Lynn's sister on. It wasn't Crystal Gale. I can't remember her name, but anyways, so you know there was some pretty big big names uh, in that sense. Yeah. But then when I moved to Vancouver and I started doing uh, like in '87, that's the first time I ever sang with Mike Reno. Um, yeah because I was with the same agency he was with. Because um, mm -hmm. I moved from Winnipeg as a singer because I had I had spent time in Vancouver doing sessions um, with my band from Winnipeg. Uh, I'd let mm -hmm. them know when I was coming and they'd hire me to do sessions and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, when I did move to Vancouver, I let Feldman know that I was coming. Mm -hmm. And... Like shortly after that, they called me and asked me if I wanted to sing with Mike for Timmy's Telethon. It was with mm -hmm. Lloyd Robertson. He, he was the host. <clears throat> but we had to do this song called Let the Music Play, and it was going to be a duet, and we were going to open the telethon. So I'm like, hell yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was kind of how yeah. I reconnected because I met him in, earlier in Winnipeg, but then I got to meet him again. So singing with him was, you know, obviously that was a huge, huge step. Yeah, yeah. I got hired a lot, uh, like, I don't know how many years in a row, to do the uh, the telethon in February, uh, the show of hearts, when they used to have a live yeah. band in the yeah. pit and background singers. Yeah. So I was a background singer a lot. 
So I got to sing with Ray Charles on that show. Um, mm-hmm. So that was super cool. I was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and then just like doing, yeah. because I was a session singer um, and I, you know, they knew I could rock out whatever um, Paul Rogers was doing yeah. his first, um, his first solo record. And uh, mm-hmm. his producer, Pat, Pat Glover, I think he's the one who suggested yeah. me. I'm not sure. But I got to sing on his solo album, which was super cool. Because I was always a fan of his voice. Like, Bad Company, give I me a break, right? What a voice. Oh, my gosh. I have to tell you a really funny story. I was, uh, this is, I don't even know when it was, pr- mm, like, probably 15 years ago now, maybe. I don't know, maybe not quite that long. And I got a call from Pat Glover uh, asking to come and sing a session. And it was me and Linda Kidder and singing backups. And it was at just at somebody's house out in, you know, our whole neck of the woods. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I was introduced to the person, but it was just on a first name basis. And here's the thing. I can name that tune for so many songs in like two notes or less, but I have no visual reference point for so many musicians because it's always been something I've listened to and not watched. I, I, I haven't engaged in music in terms of like watching music videos and watching. Right. So I don't know what musicians look like half the time. And so Linda and I are singing the Bee Gees. We're doing this thing. It's a tune about Elvis and it's, it's great tune. And, and the, uh, the, the songwriter has to go take a phone call leaves. And so it's just Linda and Pat and I, and I said to the, the, just them, I said, it's a great song. And I I love his voice. The song really reminds me of an old bad company tune seagull. And they both looked at me like, how big an idiot are you? <laughs> and he goes, well, yeah, because that's Paul Rogers. That <laughs> He is bad company. <laughs> and all I could think was, I am so glad he was not in the room when I said that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, bad company, there weren't any videos back then, right? I mean, yeah. 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 I mean, you knew the songs because if you, you know, they yeah. play the radio all the time, right? That's hilarious. Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. No I, idea. I, I, was, I had just spent like, I whatever, star- two, three hours with him. Was, no idea who I he was. I was totally starstruck when I walked in the studio and shook his hand. I was just like, yeah. oh my God, I can't believe I'm singing with one of my vocal heroes. You know? Well, looking back at it, I think I'm really glad I didn't know who he was until after. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, right. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, in the course of your career, you have also worked as a booking agent. Yeah. Um, as well as a singer. And do you want to talk about how that sort of came about and what you learned from that experience? Yeah. Um, it's funny. I, I, our friends, Kelly and Sarah from Dr. Strangelove, I yeah. used to be kind of like the unofficial seventh member of the band or sixth yeah. Eighth member of the band. I can't remember how many were in that group. Six. <laughs> how many so people was, are in yeah, Strange Love? Unofficial <laughs> seventh member because I used to sub for both of them, right, all the time. And yeah. I remember a friend of mine was having a having a do, and they wanted they wanted Doctor Strange Love, and they didn't want to go through, mm-hmm. you know, the hoops. So yeah. they, he asked me to hire them. So I did, and I remember going to the show, and and watching them perform and for the first time not feeling like I sure wish I was up there with them. Uh-huh. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, for so many years, you just like, you can't wait to get on stage and, you know, performing and singing. It's such a rush yeah. and such a high and it still is. Yeah. But, um, I remember that f- having the feeling that, wow, that's, this is kind of cool. I, I don't have the urge to run up and be on stage with them. I'm the person who put them there tonight yeah and that and that's a cool feeling and then yeah. um my friend john teddy who used to own richards on richards in in vancouver um mm-hmm. he was opening up uh the georgia street bar and grill 
mm-hmm. and in downtown Vancouver. And he phoned me up one night and he said, you know, I'm doing this thing. And he goes, I'm thinking of maybe having entertainment on the Friday and Saturday. What do you think about that? And I said, hey, that'd be a great idea. <clears throat> thinking he's going to ask me to play. Well, he did. Mm-hmm. He said, can you, can you uh, do next weekend? And I was playing with another uh, couple of fellows, Jim Foster and from Foster Child and uh, Rocco mm-hmm. Vaujoa from One Horse Blue. So mm-hmm. the three of us had a trio. We were called Guilty Pleasures. And so we agreed <laughs> to go and play that weekend. Well, it was a huge success. People were so excited about being able to have dinner mm-hmm. and have a few drinks and yeah. listen to some music. And, and then he went, you know what? I want to do this every weekend. Will you book it for me? I said, really? He goes, well, you know everybody. And I said, yeah, okay. So I did. And that was kind of the, my foray into it. And also my, my, my old friend, good friend, Howard Blank, who uh, was instrumental in in opening up the casinos in Vancouver. Um, It's funny because we, back in the day when I was with a band called station to station and we play Richards all the time, Howard would come in and he was kind of, um, Oh, we, anyway, we'd get him up on stage and he like do like an <laughs> intro or something. Cause he's like an amazing auctioneer as well. Right. Yeah. Anyway. So he was just like this little pimply face guy, you know, like that we liked cause he was so such yeah. a keener go getter and <clears throat> excuse me. So when the casino opened, they had a, the first casino, the uh, river rock, they yeah. had, they had a lounge and, Howard knew that I had helped John with the Georgia street bar and grill. So lo and behold, mm-hmm. I get a call from Howard and he goes, I'm doing this thing. And I, you know, I don't want to go through the usual suspects. Would you be interested? Yeah. And I went, yeah, but it was like helping him at first. He said, will you yeah. help me get this room established? And I said, yeah. So, you know, we had a meeting and, you know, they offered me an office and stocks and I said, no, I'm not getting up early to drive to Richmond to be in an office. No, I'll just do it from home. Yeah. You know, thanks, but no thanks. And anyways, it, it, it lasted over 12 years. Yeah. You know, and I booked to the next casino that opened and then this one's up North and, you know, it was just like this whole, and it was a one man show too. It was just me. So it got to be a little, yeah. bit, a little bit crazy at times, but you know, I, the musicians in Vancouver are so top notch and just professional yeah. and, you know, I didn't, I was lucky. I never worked with anybody who was unprofessional. Everybody did a great job. They made me look amazing, <laughs> you know? Well, and they were great rooms to well, play yeah. in. I mean, that's, and I fought to get that's them good it, money. You know? Yes, you they did. And I mean, I was lucky enough place, to, right? Yeah. They yeah. did. I was lucky enough to play in those exactly, rooms yeah. when, when <clears> you were booking them and they, they were great rooms to play in this, the, sound yeah. staff so like great sound men um and and just a really nice vibe in yeah. those i, I, I of, loved playing state those of the rooms. art equipment right from the get-go yep yeah thanks for joining us today so that was actually just part one of our interview and i would love it if you come back on thursday to check out the second part of our interview there's so much more juicy goodness i can't wait for you to check it out <laughs> <laughs>